crucifixion was not an unusual type of punishment in early first century Israel during the time of the Roman occupation. Crucifixion was quite common. Crucifixion was used by the Romans not as much as a punishment, but also as a deterrent. You see, Golgotha, or Skull Hill, was right on the outskirts of Israel, on the highway, so that everyone coming in and out of Jerusalem would see what happens to anyone who goes against Rome. You see, Jesus had suffered the, the beatings and the mockings that came with his trial. He had been scourged. We talked about that last week. He had been humiliated by the Roman soldiers. And he had been judged by Pilate. Well, this morning I want to talk about his crucifixion. I want to clarify some things. I want to make you understand what really happened. And I want to do it through the eyewitness of the Apostle John. Now, first of all, I think it's important that we talk about the method of crucifixion. You see, it's important that we understand why crucifixion existed. You see, in first century Israel, they did not have prisons as we understand prisons. There was one kind of prison. It was a debtor's prison. And you went to debtor's prison when you owed someone money that you couldn't pay back. And you weren't incarcerated and locked in a cell. There was, there was work to be done at this prison. And you had to stay there and work for long enough so that you could repay your debt. And then you were set free. They didn't have felon prisons like we do today. In first century Israel, the old uh, law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth still applied. So if you were caught stealing, you lost your hand. They didn't put you in prison. And if you were guilty of a crime against Rome, the punishment was crucifixion. Now, there are some misunderstandings about crucifixion itself. Uh, you did not die in crucifixion because of blood loss. You did not die because of the wounds that you received. In crucifixion, the way that you died was suffocation. Now, you can't all do it right now, but after church today, when you get home, if you are able, take your arms and put them high and far behind you and try to breathe. It's hard. And what would happen is the feet were nailed to the cross and the wrists were nailed to the cross. And the only way that you could breathe was to push or pull yourself up so that you could get a breath. And after a while, you were unable to do that effectively, and you would eventually suffocate. It usually did not happen quickly. It was often as many as three or four or five or more days that an individual was on the cross. The fact that Jesus died within a few hours was very unusual. But you can imagine with all of the weight of our sins on his back, it was probably hard to breathe. Crucifixion, I said, happened in a public place because it was an example. And Jesus was made an example of. Well, that's the method. Now I want to talk about the sign the sign that Pilate wrote said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, if you remember from last week, I don't think Pilate especially wanted to crucify Jesus. Pilate was mostly responsible for keeping peace in Israel. Because remember, I told you the Romans didn't leave a lot of soldiers. They just left a cohort, which was about 600, in order to keep the peace. And if peace did not continue to be kept, more soldiers would have to be brought in, and guess who would be punished? 
Pilate. So he was mostly concerned about keeping the peace. And when the Jewish leaders came to him and said, look, you got to take care of this Jesus guy because he's going to cause trouble. I'm sure Pilate thought, wait a minute, wasn't it just a few days ago that I was looking out my bedroom window and I saw this big parade of people with palm branches and throwing their coats on the ground, claiming him king? What if I do crucify him? Maybe there'll be even more ruckus. But you see, the pressure of the religious leaders was enough that Pilate finally buckled. I'm sure he didn't want to do it. In fact, some of the Gospels say that Pilate washed his hands after he gave the sentence to show that he wanted to have nothing to do with this. But Pilate got in his final licks with this sign because he knew that the Jewish leaders didn't want Jesus to be known as the king of the Jews, and so he kind of poked him in the eye and said, here's what I'm going to put on this sign. He wrote it in three different languages so that everyone who went by would know who this person was. Christ's crime was not that he said, love one another. Christ's crime was not that he healed the sick or raised Lazarus from the dead. Christ's crime was he upset the religious leaders. You see, they had struck a delicate balance of power with the Roman authorities, and they liked the position that they were in. But God wasn't happy with it because they were misleading the people. The, the faith had become more of a transaction of rules and money and not a relationship between our Creator and us. And so Jesus came to straighten things out, and when he did that, he threatened the religious leader's power. And let me tell you from experience, when you threaten the religious leader's power, they will get you every time. I got the bruises to prove it. Well, then I'm going to talk about the proclamation that Pilate made. He said, what I've written, I've written. In the history of Israel that was being written, in all of the city hall papers and books, when people looked up to see what the crime that Jesus was convicted was, it would say, the king of the Jews. And Pilate was not willing to change that. That was his proclamation. And it has stood the test of time. Then I want to make a clarification. John writes, But his robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving, so that they said to each other, Let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. One of the things that frustrates me more about church than just about anything else is when the guys in my position get it wrong. For too long, the theory or the common knowledge out there has been that Jesus was poor. I'm sorry, he wasn't. You see, in order to have a single piece of woven cloth for a tunic, it had to be custom made. It was woven specifically for him. It was an expensive piece of clothing. It was a custom made suit. It was Brooks Brothers, not Walmart like this one. <laughs> Jesus was an entrepreneur. He was a carpenter. He was a member of a burgeoning middle and upper middle class in first century Israel. And he was well off enough to be able to afford this expensive piece of clothing. Jesus wasn't poor. My gosh, how do you think he took a three-year sabbatical and went around the country preaching? He had to have some means. 
Just as an aside, a lot of the times you'll hear uh, in the Christmas story, Joseph and Mary, they were poor, so they had to stay in a barn. No. Joseph was wealthy enough in, so that he had to be counted for Caesar Augustus's... Why can't I think of the word? <laughs> Census, that's what it is. You see, in first century Israel, they didn't count everybody. Billy Bob didn't get counted because Billy Bob didn't have enough to be taxed. The only individuals who had to go to their homeland to be counted were those who could afford to pay tax. Joseph was a carpenter and a property owner. He was a descendant of the house of David. He was a man of means. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this. It's not a sin to be a person of means. It's a sin to be a person of means who uses it inappropriately. Even Jesus was well off enough so that these soldiers recognized, hey, this is a nice coat. Let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who wins it. Just wanted to clarify that for you today. Then I want to talk about the adoption. I think it's interesting that in the middle of this passage, we get this little adoption vignette. Jesus is on the cross, and below him are some very interesting people. It was his mother, his aunt, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. I don't know if you can remember back to Easter, but I preached about Mary Magdalene and said she didn't appear anywhere in the gospel until the very end. This is where Mary Magdalene appears. Not until chapter 19 do we hear the name Mary Magdalene. Now, if you remember, John's gospel was written when he was probably in his 80s. And the other gospels had been around for maybe as long as 30 or 40 years. And John wanted to clarify some things and get some things right. Because the church, I'm sure, was growing in that part of the Mediterranean. And the gospel stories were being circulated. And people were starting to ask questions. Wait a minute. How do you know that Jesus said, I thirst? How do you know that, that these people were there? How do you know that all this stuff happened? John is letting us know that he was an eyewitness because the other Gospels say all the disciples scattered. But John was there with Jesus' mother, with his aunt, with a family friend, and Mary Magdalene. These people who were gutsy enough to stand at the foot of Jesus' cross tell us something very interesting about who they were. They were people who didn't care what happened to them if they showed up. Jesus' mother, a very good family friend, and Jesus' best friend, John, were there. And John said, or Jesus said to Mary, Woman, behold your son, and behold your mother, he said to John. Now, a lot of theologians have said that Jesus said this because he wanted to make sure that Mary was taken care of in her old age. Strangely, I disagree. <laughs> I don't think that Mary needed to be taken care of because the Gospels tell, her, tell us that she had other children. I think what happened was that Jesus wanted Mary and John to be connected so that she would be connected to the disciples. Because we all know about Jewish mothers, and they make sure stuff gets done. <laughs> and so there was an adoption that took place at the cross. And then I want to talk about the transaction after he took the wine, Jesus said, it's done, complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. 
Some translations read, it is finished. It's important that we look at the original languages. Now, I'm not one of those Greek scholar kind of guys. I got to do the work. I looked up the Greek word, and it's tetelestai. So I did a little research on tetelestai, and it's the word that was used when a sale was completed. When two negotiating parties had come to an agreement on a price, they would say, tetelestai, the deal is done. It was also used when shepherds would bring forth a perfect sheep to the temple and it would be sacrificed for someone's sin. They would say, tetelestai. When the servant's work was completed for the week and they came to the master to receive their pay, the master would hand them the cash and say, tetelestai. Everything's taken care of. The deal is done. You see, there was a transaction that happened on the cross. And when Jesus said, tetelestai, he was referring to a deal between himself and two other entities. The first entity was the Father. Jesus said, look, I've done my end of the deal. I've lived this life. I've shared the gospel. I've healed people. I've lived a sinless life. And now I've given my life for all of humanity. Father, you live up to your end of the bargain and you forgive them. The second entity that he was speaking to on that cross when he said to Telestai is us. You see, we've got an end of the bargain to fulfill as well. Our end of the bargain is to ask for forgiveness, to commit our lives to our Savior, to live like we mean it, not perfectly, but with all our gusto. There was a transaction that happened on that cross between Jesus and the Father and you and me. And so finally, I want to talk about the point to all of this. The eyewitness to these things has presented an accurate report. He saw it himself and is telling the truth so that you also will believe. The entirety of John's gospel was so that you might believe. This Jesus isn't a fairy tale. John was there. He saw what happened. He experienced it. And now he's telling us so that we might believe. Ladies and gentlemen, a deal has been struck on our behalf. This Jesus of Nazareth was crucified for our sin. The Creator has said that all we have to do is ask for forgiveness and commit our lives to Him, and we will be saved. I guess it's up to us now. 